I'm actually going to start recording this uh, webinar so that other folks can take a look at it later. Um, so thank you for joining today um, to listen to this explanation of preparing your talk for the 2017 Marine Oceans Colloquium. If you've not met me before, my name is Laura Good. I am the Education Manager here at the Center for Ocean Solutions, which is part of Stanford University. We're also a partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institution here in Monterey. Um, and part of our work is better preparing future ocean leaders. And we do that primarily through our marine program, which stands for the Monterey Area Research Institutions Network for Education. And marine is a collaboration between the Center for Ocean Solutions and seven Monterey Bay Area campuses, including Stanford and Stanford Hopkins uh, Marine Station, uh, to provide professional development opportunities that better prepare them as leaders through skill development around core uh, interdisciplinary leadership areas. For example, things like negotiation, communication, uh, interdisciplinary problem solving, and collaboration. Um, and the colloquium we have every year is basically for a way to marine to showcase their work across the campuses, their ocean work from a variety of disciplines, but also a really unique networking opportunity uh, for these campuses and the faculty, the staff, the, and majority of the students um, to get together and talk about their work, talk about what's going on in the region. Um, and basically get their work out there in a safe place to practice doing a variety of different talks. So the colloquium this year, it is a student organized activity. Um, between our seven campuses, we have a variety of student representatives and each year a committee of those representatives comes together to plan the colloquium. They uh, organize what, what types of talks that will go on, what types of breakout sessions the colloquium will uh, provide, um, as well as who will give those talks. So if you have submitted an abstract, um, those students are currently looking at those abstracts. Now, uh, if they've not already made a decision, which I do believe they have, um, so hopefully you've heard back from them. If you have any questions uh, later on about the colloquium or about marine in general, you're welcome to email uh, myself, which is marine at centerforoceansolutions.org. Um, and you can find that information back on the colloquium flyers if you need it um, or on the registration. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you an introduction um, to how you might want to prepare a talk for the Marine Oceans Colloquium, um, depending on what type of talk uh, you are providing at the colloquium. Of course, there's lots of different types, which I'll get into very shortly. And the reason why I want to go over this is because I'm trying to emphasize the need to practice and to prepare for any talk. Um, when it comes to talking to a variety of different groups, um, it's very important to spend a significant amount of time uh, familiarizing yourself, um, not only with who you're going to talk to, but how you might want to come across um, to that audience. And also, you know, what really you want to get excited about talking, uh, talking about what you, what do you really want to focus on? And sometimes that can be a really hard thing to do, even if you've got a very specific abstract that you've provided in order to get into the event in the first place. So hopefully this will provide a little clarification, not only about the event and the types of talks, but also how you might just prepare for any talk moving forward um, for a variety of different audience, audiences. The other thing is, is I want to give an opportunity for folks to ask questions if they have any. Um, I have sent a little announcement out that you're able to ask uh, questions. Uh, you're welcome to interrupt me, but it is, um, you know, it's often easier for you to save the questions until the end, unless they're particularly pressing. Um, I'll try to talk to kind of keep my end of the talking down to about 30 minutes um, and then give so that there's plenty of time to kind of clarification after that. Those of you who are going to be listening to the recording later on um, and are not interacting with this live, uh, you can in fact um, email me directly, as I say, at marine at centerforoceansolutions.org if you have any clarifying questions um, or even want me to take a look at slides um, or, you know, kind of your strategy for what, how you're going to focus your talk for the event. And just to confirm, the Marine Oceans Colloquium this year is happening on April 8th at Moss Landing Marine Labs. So don't forget the date, that's pretty important to show up at the right time in the right place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here. I've got a Prezi to provide to you all. So let me open this up um, and get it going. 
might take a couple of minutes for it to be happy. So just bear with me. Okay, so I should be sharing my screen right now. I'm just gonna go full screen with this Prezi. Hopefully everybody should be able to see it. If you can't see it, please do let me know. I'll send a little announcement again for how you might interact live with me if you need to let me know anything. Um, and so as I say, I'll take about, ooh, about 30 minutes to go over these different elements um, and give you guys a chance to ask questions at the end. Okay, so the Marine Oceans Colloquium. As I say, it's a conference type event. It's an event for Marine to show its stuff. Um, for uh, folks from a variety of different disciplines from our past seven partner campuses in the region to get together, to share their work, to get other people excited about their work um, and really give people the chance to learn how to talk to other disciplines. Um, this is a big deal when it comes to solving big environmental problems. If you can't talk to folks outside your discipline, it's very hard to come towards solutions for environmental issues um, if you can't bring together the expertise needed to work on an issue. Um, so this is really good practice for everybody to do that. Um, it can put you outside your comfort zone a little bit. The styles of the talks that this colloquium involves that our students put together are often a little different from perhaps what you're at, usually asked to do in, in your academic settings or even perhaps in your professional settings. Um, if you're a practitioner, that is, that's actually working with our partner organizations. Um, but, you know, at the same time, take the challenge as a positive thing. Um, if you're feeling a little bit apprehensive about giving a talk at this colloquium, that's a good thing. Um, this is going to be a learning opportunity, um, and I fully encourage you to embrace that. Um, if you felt like this was an easy thing to do, then you're probably not going to learn much from it. So a challenge is um, a good opportunity. Let's see if this thing wants to work for me. Here we go. It's going to be really slow, isn't it? There we go. <laughs> so first things first, I really want to throw this out here and highlight this very important matter, is that good communication is absolutely fundamental to innovation in environmental research and problem solving. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, when it comes to thinking about environmental and ocean issues as a whole, as I said before, there's a variety of different folks you need at the table, stakeholders, expertise, etc., to be able to work through a problem and come to some solutions on whatever level that you're trying to work to a solution on. Obviously, environmental problems can be uh, wicked, meaning they're very complex and have a lot of different players, stakeholders, and expertise involved. Um, but when it comes to it, these folks need to interact. And if they don't communicate well, it's very, very hard for them to interact. So, so think about the colloquium as an opportunity to learn a bit more about that, about communicating with folks across disciplines um, and across interests areas too. Something that is particularly interesting to you might not be that interesting to another individual, but you're bound to have something in common in terms of an, uh, an issue or a problem or a piece of environmental research or ocean research uh, that you're working on. So it, it's kind of learning to come across what your common ground is, um, but also engage another human being in what motivates you and what engages you. So what makes good communication? Well, you know, a lot of folks will spend entire talks talking about what makes good communication. In all honesty, most of you already know what makes good communication. Most of you are currently in academic programs where you're taking a variety of different classes or you attend a lot of talks, lectures, seminars, panels, etc. yourself, um, you know what works for you and what doesn't. And you can think about this in terms of, you know, what do I want to get out of X, Y, and Z when I attend um, these, you know, when I attend a talk? What is going to make me sit there for an entire 45 minutes or however long it lasts and listen? Um, and really, there's some very basic things. So what I want you to sit, what I want you to think about right now, uh, just in your own head or jot down to yourself, what do you expect to see when we think of a good speaker or a good talk? 
And I want you to bear that in mind the entire time that I'm running the, this, this little presentation here, this little webinar, because in the end, that's what you want to aim for. If it's something that will, if the way a speaker engages you works well, um, you probably want to try out those tactics or those um, behaviors yourself. Uh, I'm not going to spend the entire time lecturing you about what communication because I'm trying to point out that you probably already know this. It's just kind of putting these things together to make it work in practice is the challenge. So while you're jotting those things down, I also want you to think about the purpose of your talk. Now, here's a crunch point that when people are preparing for talks, they often forget. What is the goal of what they're doing? Now, for events like the Marine Colloquium, the goal that the event itself actually sets can be quite loose. So for us, for example, it's simply to get folks from a variety of different ocean disciplines in the door and talking to one another about each other's work, to share their work, to find common interests, and to network, essentially. That's a pretty big, loose goal. But you yourself are going to have your own goals. You are going to have goals about what you would like to come across specifically about your work. Maybe there's certain folks in the audience you're particularly interested in engaging, maybe faculty from other universities, or maybe student, other students doing similar work to yourself. Um, or even funders, maybe you never know, who might be in the audience. So I want you to think about that pretty deeply um, and make sure that that stays in the back of your mind throughout the entire time that you prepare for your talk. Because it's very hard to prepare for something if you don't know why you're doing it. <laughs> um, it's essentially, I want you to think about backwards designing your talk. Uh, once you know the end goal, um, it's a lot easier to kind of come up with a strategy for how you're going to reach that goal um, rather than just jumping on in there, crafting a talk before you've even thought about what you what impact you want your talk. So just to clarify, our marine talks this year at the colloquium are very fast paced dialogue events, meaning they are meant to put you on and get you on your toes in terms of learning to communicate your work efficiently but effectively. Um, and not give you the length of time that perhaps you're used to with traditional academic talks. The idea behind this really is to enlighten us, but make it quick. Um, this is an idea that came out of Ignite style talks, which are basically five minute talks um, that were put together by a variety of different um, groups in order to kind of highlight the significance of short talks. Um, but they're really meant to build public speaking confidence in individuals. If you can talk about your work in this fast paced um, style, um, then you are going to feel better about being able to communicate about your work on the fly. Um, and that's not a small thing because the majority of the time when you're interacting with new folks um, and have opportunities to engage new folks in your work, you're not going to have entire hour long seminars to do that. Um, you're going to have short dialogue events, and this is a way for you to practice doing that, but in a more sort of semi-formal setting. The other thing to think about is that the idea is, to, is to, to have fun with what you're doing, is to be creative, and that show that presentations don't need to be death by PowerPoint. It, <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, again, this comes out uh, of the ideas from TED Talks and from Ignite Style Talks, which you can take a look at a little bit more deeply by Googling around. Um, but, you know, you know exactly what I mean. We've all been in one of those lectures where we are falling asleep, where we are bored to death, where we don't want to listen anymore. That's what we mean by death by PowerPoint, where we just want to run away screaming, even if the content itself could be deeply engaging. There's probably a reason we went in that room in the first place, but sometimes that reason disappears very quick um, if the style of the talk is not engaging enough or um, or appeals to us as, you know, actual human beings and not robots. So a way to be able to have that fun and demonstrate that your presentation doesn't need to be death by PowerPoint is to understand your talk type. So for the colloquium, we've got four different types of talks that we are asking our participants to engage in. That is a TED style talk, which is slightly longer. 
uh, interactive talks, which are more like getting gaming audience interactions, um, almost more workshoppy in a sense, um, but basically having audiences doing things during uh, the talk. Three minute message, which is an extremely short dialogue event um, to describe work in three minutes and our demonstration expo, which are more tabletop style, you know, demonstrations of your work. Um, they're more like, it's almost like an academic poster session, but without the poster. Um, just other tangible items that you might have relating to your work that you can have a conversation about in an informal sort of reception setting. So the expo is quite different from the, uh, from the other types of talks. The other types of talks are in fact, sage on the stage, um, talking to an audience. Uh, the expo is more in a reception style, um, but even still, uh, all of these considerations that I'm going to go through today about crafting your talk are all very relevant. Now, the big takeaway from this particular conversation here is you need to ask yourself, what do you want the audience to do with your talk? And that should be a big driver. That is the purpose of your talk. What do you want them to do with it? If that's just to have a little bit more of awareness of the type of work you do, okay. Um, but at the same time, how are you going to get them to increase that awareness? Think about it a little bit more deeply than I just want them to listen and to care. Um, what kind of more concrete things do you want the audience to do? For example, do you want them to come up and talk to you following your talk? Um, just be real with yourself about why you're there in the first place, other than to have a, you know, have a presentation written on your resume. So presentation formats. So let's go into a little bit more detail about these. The TED style talks are the longest um, of the sage on the stage style style talks. Um, for the event. They're 15 minutes long. Um, the purpose of these talks is to use good public speaking and multimedia to explain an interesting topic. Excuse me, just banging on my desk there. The idea is to use visuals that enhance key ideas. So I'm sure many of you have seen a lot of different TED talks. And if you haven't, and you're doing one for this event, I absolutely strongly recommend that you go Google around and take, some, uh, take a look at a TED talk. There's a very famous one by Sylvia Earle, um, who, if you're not sure who that is, is a famous um, marine conservationist that you might like to get to know a little bit more. Um, when you look at TED style talks, they really keep you engaged. They're fairly short and sweet in terms of you know, traditional talks, um, but they really home in on key messages and use a variety of video and photographic media to draw your attention to those key points that they're trying to make. Three minute messages. This is a different type of talk that's basically trying to convince the audience why they should give a hoot about what you do. Um, and this really is trying to model the elevator pitch, but it's almost like a longer elevator pitch. When folks are told, oh, you need to be able to give the elevator pitch, you know, the 30 second spiel about your work, that's exactly what they're referring to, a 30 second spiel. This is like an extended elevator pitch. It's really getting to the main outwork of your work and the so what. Um, and in all honesty, slides are pretty inefficient in terms of trying to fit into three minutes here. So if you're gonna use slides for a three minute message, um, I would actually use them with caution or for very, very specific purposes to enhance your message. And, and that's exactly it. They're focused on just providing a message, not even necessarily giving a talk. So interactive talks, um, as I mentioned before, they're more hands-on talks that are meant to use props or short activities that the, the, the audience physically engages in. Um, they also could involve having the audience have a quick discussion about things. Think pair share activities are a good example of that, where basically you pose a, a question or an idea to an audience and then you give them, say, 30 seconds to a minute um, to ponder that question or that idea and to share their thoughts with their neighbor. And that's a really simple way to encourage interactivity in a talk. Interactive talks um, also may, may look more like inter interpretive talks that perhaps you might see somewhere like 
in a national park or in a state park or at, in the museum space or in an aquarium. So you have talks that kind of really home in um, on a key idea um, and get the audience to, in, to discuss and interact with them on a slightly deeper level than just passively listening to a conversation, if that makes sense. Um, interactive talks can be very creative, um, particularly in these short timeframes. So if you're interested to kind of get a sense of what I mean by interactive talks, I would suggest that you take a look at um, ranger talks in national parks. They're the perfect examples of an interactive or interpretive talks. Um, and rangers, in fact, the National Park Service are really the perpetrators of interpretation. They're the ones that started that type of communication. Um, and they're, they're a great example of how to engage quickly and deeply um, and encourage enthusiasm in an audience. And then lastly is our expo, uh, our demonstration expo. And this is what I was mentioning before. Um, as an alternative to a traditional academic poster session. Um, they are hands-on demonstrations of tangible items such as equipment, software, websites, um, materials, uh, reports, anything that basically gives you a chance to have a conversation in, an, in a reception type space. Um, so again, like a traditional academic poster session where you have more time to sort of chat and ponder and point things out um, and physically share things with another human being. Now, that's what the expo demonstrations, their demonstration expo is all about. The tabletop activities, essentially, um, to encourage much deeper conversation in smaller groups. So now that you've sort of thought about the purpose of your talk and what you want the audience to do with your talk, and also what type of talk you're actually giving. Now you want to think about your audience. And I have this saying, um, which is know your audience, not just their age. And the reason why I say that is because this is strangely how a lot of people tend to think about their audience when somebody says to them, know your audience. They tend to think about whether they're young or they're old, um, and therefore how that might influence their engagement with what they're talking about. And this sort of comes from a good place, but it, it's a little bit of a limited way of thinking about it. Because in reality, yes, what you know about your audience should shape your presentation style. Okay, But really, you want to be thinking about it in terms of that audience's prior potential prior knowledge and experience, um, in terms of what type of group they are. And what I'm saying here is like nobody in front of you is a blank slate. And particularly not at the Marine Oceans Colloquium, <laughs> you're going to have a lot of other folks that do lots of different types of ocean related research. They're definitely not blank slates. Um, they're coming to that event um, with a variety of different background and experiences that are all going to influence how they perceive what you are explaining to them. So it's in your interest to basically do a little bit more research around that group um, and find out, you know, you know, have a so if you have, if spend a little time thinking to yourself how they might respond to your work, be the, be at the type of group that they are. And one way you can do some research around marine is you can take a look at the marine website. So if you go to centerforoceansolutions.org slash marine, um, you can take a look at this, the suite of work we do um, and you can get a sense of uh, the sort of activities we offer and the campuses and levels of participants that interact in the program. You can also talk with your campus student liaison. They are key informants of the program. You can also ask me. Um, but to give you kind of an overview, the really key takeaway about Marine as a group of individuals is that they are interdisciplinary, ocean interested, uh, early career professionals. So they are seven campuses worth of ocean related research and career um, sorry, I'm messing up my words right there. We have seven campuses worth of early career professionals who are interested in ocean related research and careers. And this can include folks from the natural and social sciences, from resource management, from engineering and technology, from policy and law, from communication and from education. Okay, so think about that pretty deeply and what that means. If you are communicating to an interdisciplinary group, 
you need to be able to a use language that can communicate across disciplines um, you also b need to be able to utilize messages or key ideas that resonate with um, the ocean folks as a whole okay so this is not going to be like communicating to say a multi-generational family group um, that you maybe met while you were at the aquarium and you were trying to you know explain to them what you did or if you were talking to your grandma it's not a complete 101 basic of what you do but what it is is kind of some key ideas in related to the bigger picture of ocean problem solving um, but again the takeaway here is that they are interdisciplinary there's not going to be any one person in that room who is the same as another in terms of what they study um, but they do all care about the ocean and they do all want to be part of conversations that are helping solve problems um, that influence that affect the ocean environment and so that's an, a, a good thing to, to consider so once you've had a thought about the audience and who might be in that audience um, and how you might change or shift your language or shift your approach based on that audience you want to really get down to the nitty gritty of the content of the talk. So first you want to think about a theme. What is the overarching theme or message of your talk? And then from there, you can plan a, basically a step-by-step -step explanation of this idea or this theme. So another way to describe the theme is a big idea. And then from there, kind of break down that big idea into perhaps three or four main sub ideas that allow you to explain that big idea fully. Um, and you could break that up into a, an intro, a main body and a conclusion if you wanted to, but it doesn't have to be that linear. Um, sometimes it's easier in this case just to kind of drop down everything you want to talk about in relation to that big idea and then pick out the top three or four things that are most important to understanding it or to understanding your work. But I absolutely would recommend just homing in on one big idea and that's perfectly fine. You cannot possibly talk about everything to do with your work or your interests in such a short period of time. So be okay with homing in on one thing um, and then try to break it down into three or four sub ideas that help you build the step-by-step -step and creative explanation. From there, this will help you physically craft the talk and the visuals. Um, and I kind of want to get into the visuals a little bit here if you do decide that you want to use slides for your talk. Now, I say that because you might not want to use slides for your talk. For example, if you are doing, uh, if you are part of the demonstration expo, you might decide that you want slides running on autoplay in the background on a computer that just kind of go over some of the basic ideas of what you're showing or even just some photos of what you're doing. The same goes if you're doing the three minute message. You might just want a photo or a couple of photos that are auto playing in the background to kind of get what you're talking about. Or even uh, with the three minute message, you might want a series of photographs or visuals that auto scroll you know, every 30 seconds, something like that, um, just to kind of cue in with what you're talking about. For the more atypical talks, the TED style talks and or the interactive talks, um, the visuals is really, you know, where, with, where you might consider more traditional slides. Um, but what I'm going to try and get into here is that try and think a little bit deeper about how you craft these slides in order to create a very effective talk. So firstly, I would suggest that you think about A, the text. Your visuals need to reflect the language you're using to talk to your audience. So if you spend all that time considering the purpose of your talk, the style of the talk, and the audience that you are talking to, you don't want your slides to be disconnected from how you physically speak to the audience. You want it to reflect it whole, wholeheartedly. And a way to think about this is um, register. So register is a way that linguists describe language used by certain communities or groups. Um, 
And there are lots of different communities or groups, obviously, that have lots of different types of language or how they use language. Um, but a really easy way to kind of think about this as you're crafting your slides is to use what's called everyday registers, which is very different than perhaps what you might see in atypical academic writing, which is usually on the scientific register end. Um, scientific registers, for example, tend to use long Latin root words and long sentences, jargon and acronyms, things that take a little while for you to process as you're reading. You don't have that time on slides, you, and you want them to be able to, the slides to enhance your ideas, not distract the audience from listening to you, you want them to listen to you. So using everyday registers such as active speech, shorter sentences, concrete subjects and analogies um, helps introduce these scientific ideas um, much easier. Now, when I say scientific, I'm using that in a very general sense. I mean more research-based ideas or academic ideas. Um, scientific doesn't necessarily have to mean science. It can also just mean technical. So, you know, a really easy way for you to might do that in a slide is to use a statement or a sentence as a title. If you look at the top of this slide right here, the, the title is your visuals, well, there's insert text here, but the subtitle is your visuals should reflect the language you're using to talk to your audience. That's the message I'm trying to portray. Therefore, that's why it's the title. It's a super easy way to do that, um, to enhance the sub idea that you're trying to get at. The second part to your slides is obviously thinking about uh, pictures. Um, and Pictures are fantastic. They tell a thousand words. They help us to get to the point. Um, and you know, you can use a variety of images to illustrate your point that you're making in that slide or in you know that that section of your talk. You can use maps. You can use charts or graphs, photographs. You know, all diagrams, all sorts of things. Um, but the key to thinking about that is to be choosy about what you use. So, for example, if you're using charts or graphs. You want to use bigger and higher resolution to make sure that people in the audience can actually read the darn thing. Uh, I'm sure many of you have sat through a lecture and you've heard the speaker say, you probably can't read this, but your goal is not to do that. <laughs> if they can't read it, it's pointless to include it. So make sure you do include something they can actually look at and try and interpret. Another trick with things like diagrams, charts, and graphs is annotations, super easy. Draws attention to exactly the point you're trying to make. Audiences are lazy. They don't wanna work for it. They want to be told what to look at. This is an easy way to tell them what to look at without actually telling them what to look at. So for example, with the sea surface temperature image right here, it's pointing out to a particular anomaly and the arrow draws your eye to said anomaly so the audience doesn't have to work for it. The same goes with photographs and a lot of folks forget this. So this, these are a couple of photographs that was from my own research, um, looking at how families interact um, with a variety of different exhibits and museum settings. Photos can't speak for themselves either. So using annotations to kind of draw attention to why you put that photo up there in the first place um, is a very powerful tool. Um, so, for example, this image is pointing out that there are adults in a family groups attempting to facilitate learning experiences for their children, and also that there's a video researcher in the background, and that's how we collected the data. The last thing about photographs in slides, and you know, you're probably laughing at this a little bit with a silly banana slide, but you really need to think about the design consideration of a slide overall. Distracting background images, a ridiculous amount of text. These seems like very kind of common sense things not to do in a slide, but you'll be surprised how folks kind of get, they fall into that hole when they're crafting their, their slides, particularly if they're copying slides over from prior presentations or prior talks. Be very aware that background images can really prevent an audience from even being able to read what you're looking at, as does a lot of text. Nobody is gonna read that amount of text. If you do actually read that text right there, you'll see that it's talking about death by PowerPoint, which is kind of one of my jokes, you know, and the anti-PowerPoint party. <laughs> I'm not part of the anti-PowerPoint party, but the what I'm trying to draw to your attention is, is you probably didn't read that because it's so much text, it's intimidating. Okay, and again, 
if the audience is going to read it, if it's going to be too difficult for them to read, either because it's hard to read or because there's just it's overwhelming, then it's completely pointless. And why are you even spending your time putting it in your talk in the first place? Okay, so don't you know offset all the great work you do crafting these beautiful visuals that really help you get to the point if you have a really distracting you know amount of text or distracting background image um, that goes along with it um, and so really with your visuals always less is more so lastly the thing that i really want to emphasize and this is another thing that most folks really don't remember to do and it's absolutely essential is you need to practice your talk you need to spend time practicing your talk okay you can do this in a variety of different ways but everybody needs to practice seasoned you know professional speakers need to practice talks um, it is the number one reason why talks can get so boring is because you know either they're taking folks are taking too long they're not getting to the point they're waffling they're jumping you know they're getting jumbled up on their words you know everybody is a human being people make mistakes but you know you're less likely to make mistakes if you practice obviously um, and a way to help you kind of practice is you can actually draft a script for what you want to say which is super useful when it comes to short very short talks the three minute messages for example I would absolutely recommend drafting a, you know, a kind of even just a loose script for yourself um, because it kind of also helps you figure out how to tie in the visuals to what you're saying. You're trying to be memorable. You're trying to be somebody that everybody in the audience actually wants to listen to. And for that, you need a level of fluidity to how you speak and how you interact with your visuals if you're using them. You're really only going to get that fluidity if you're practicing. Um, and it'll also help you practice a variety of different engagement strategies, such as um, using your talk to tell a story or walk through a process, incorporating humor, sharing per personal anecdotes, you know, things that show that you're a human being and have relatable experiences that other human beings, um, demonstrating an enthusiasm and a passion for your work, um, using analogies to explain co uh, complex concepts, which is particularly important for this indis interdisciplinary audience. Um, and also asking the audience questions to ponder. Um, and very importantly as well, being able to practice your confidence. Uh, and really confidence comes across um, much more strongly when you're well rehearsed. Um, being well rehearsed also infers professionalism. It infers you actually gave, you cared enough to actually spend some time practice. So to be aware of that, um, audiences can be quite turned off folks who didn't show that they, you know, that they spent the time actually practicing speaking to them as a group. Um, and that, that actually can be in some collaborative situations, um, can actually be, you know, a pretty critical point. If folks don't interpret that you are, that you've spent time crafting your conversation with them, um, that they may be less likely to want to engage with you moving forward. The other thing to think about here is your visuals are not the main dish. You are the main dish. Your talk, what comes out of your mouth is the main dish. Okay, so really spending more time practicing the talk than the time putting together the visuals is an important consideration. Okay, you, a lot of the reasons why people don't practice is that they've spent so much of the time they had available to work on their talk on the visuals that they don't have enough time left practice so sometimes it's worth just practicing with kind of very simple versions of your visuals that, that you can then finish up later on you really need to get the talk down um, and utilize the visuals as a way to emphasize your message or emphasize your ideas rather than be that main dish For a variety of the different talks, you can, as I mentioned, you actually can set your visuals to auto advance. Um, on PowerPoint, you can do that through using the transitions option, um, which on Max is under slideshow. Um, and you can set them to advance slide on a particular interval, like for example, 15 seconds in this, uh, in this example. 
Um, you can also get them to rotate in kiosk mode, which might be useful for those of you doing um, a tabletop activity with the demonstration expo. Um, you know, and even on the, the TED talks or the 10 minute interactive talks or the three minute messages, um, sometimes having things auto advancing behind you keeps you on task, keeps you on time. Um, also can help you practice uh, beforehand. So think about using this option. A lot of people forget about it. It's a super useful tool that PowerPoint has. Um, and, and indeed, all different types of um, slide software you use. Remember that PowerPoint, again, isn't the only tool out there. You can use Google Slides. You can use Prezi like I'm using now. Um, all of these different tools have um, a way to do auto advancing uh, or kiosk mode where they just rotate between visuals. So just to summarize, talks can be really provocative communication tools. Um, but they really can only be that provocative if you consider the, the style of the talk and its purpose, who you're talking to and what you want them to do with that information, the big idea that you're attempting to share and therefore the sub ideas that get to that idea, the design of your visuals if you do decide to use them, and therefore how the de delivery and the visuals are combined. And, you know, perhaps instead of visuals, you might be using props instead, like with the interactive tool for the demonstration expo, how those are combined and how you use them together. And then, of course, practice, 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 and then practice a bit more. And sometimes practice in front of other people so that you can get some feedback or videotape yourself so you can give yourself some feedback. Um, but either way, make sure you put some time in there to practice your talk. Um, and feel confident about what you're about to share with the rest of the room. So with that, I'm going to end there. I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, I'm going to, you know, open up this webinar for questions if anybody has any. Um, if you'd rather not ask questions over here, then um, I'm happy to uh, take questions over email. Uh, and like I said, I'm also happy to uh, take a look at anybody's slides, visuals, scripts, whatever else you want to share with me uh, moving forward. So just let me know. You can email me, Marine at centerforoceansolutions.org. Okay, so let me just send you as a reminder how you might like to do Q&A. And I'm here for questions if you have any. Very quiet on the question front, but that's okay. <laughs> you might be typing, I don't know. Aha, uh -huh, question. Awesome. Okay, have you had interactive talks uh, in the past? If so, what did people do that was particularly good? What a great question. Awesome. We have had interactive talks in the past. One that stands out to me is one that was done by a student from Hopkins Marine Station last year um, that was a squid race activity. Um, she was trying to kind of explain the significance of why you'd want to understand the mobility of squid. Um, so she actually did an activity where she had the, uh, members of the audience uh, basically design a squid using a variety of different arts and crafts materials. Um, and then they raced those squid uh, along a string because they used balloons to propel them. Um, and it really kind of drove the message home that, you know, how different physiological designs of a squid actually influenced their ability to swim and also their ability, therefore, to feed and reproduce, et cetera, et cetera. So what was really good about that talk was A, the, just the simple level of enthusiasm that she had for what she was doing um, and kind of getting the audience to kind of step out of their box a little bit and be a little bit silly. It's okay to be silly, to learn about things. Um, that's not just for middle schoolers, that's also for adults too. Um, the other great part of it was the, you know, the, in order to kind of drive that message home about the significance of different 
physiological designs um, was simply getting the audience just to be able to brainstorm to themselves what types of designs they envisioned um, that, that particular animal would have. So it was really directing the, how can I put it, it was kind of really directing the thought processes back on the audience themselves. It was putting it in their hands so they could understand deeper and therefore ask more questions. It was also just ridiculously fun, um, which meant it stood out to a lot of people. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, other types of interactive talks uh, that I haven't seen done at the colloquium in the past, but as I say that, you know, I've seen a lot of different interpretation professionals, environmental interpretation professionals do, and I, I don't mean the translating languages, I mean translating basically environmental science to a variety of different public audiences, is um, using props. And so, you know, biofacts, for example, are a really good place to start. In particular, if you're talking about different creatures, you know, so say, for example, if you were trying to describe um, how a baleen whale feeds, actually having a piece of baleen for them to look at and maybe even pass around the audience is particularly useful. Um, when folks have done talks on things like ROVs or, you know, even how water moves, if they were talking about currents, like I've seen folks have all sorts of things up at the front uh, on the stage where you know, they have something physical that the, the people can watch and, and latch onto and make sense of. Um, videos also work very well in that realm as well. So if you didn't have the ability to, you know, have a biofact or have an apparatus that could, you know, demonstrate the concept that you're trying to share, this, you could troll YouTube for hours and probably find a video that really gets at it. If you can show a short video, that's just as useful too. Um, even having people just Google things for themselves, also really useful, um, or jot down notes. And as I said, do a think pair share with their neighbor just to kind of process what they're hearing and put it in their own words. Hopefully that answered your question. Any other questions? All right, well, um, if there are no other questions, then I'm gonna end the webinar here. As I say, you're very welcome to email me um, any additional thoughts that you may have or things that you would like me to take a look at uh, in preparation for the colloquium at marine at centerforoceansolutions.org. Um, and what I can also do as well is I can have the student organizers of the colloquium share this Prezi with you so that you have, there are actually some videos in that embedded into it for you to take a look at examples. I can have that share, them share that with the presenters, the colloquial presenters, and then you can delve into that a little bit deeper. But I would also recommend that you Google around um, and take a look at some other folks' examples of that, either from the Marine YouTube channel where you can look at talks from prior years colloquiums, um, or just other people's you know, similar types of talks, for example, TED Talks um, or Speed Talks, things like that. Alrighty, well with that, I shall say goodbye. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in the cloakroom. Enjoy!